want to talk about are three sort of key points that come out of the research. The first key point, historians, the first thing they do is they pose questions. They want to know what caused this particular event. Why did this event occur? <laughs> historians by nature are curious. Ironically, who else that we work with is generally by nature curious? Students. Now, oftentimes they're curious about things that we aren't going to answer for them <laughs> or they shouldn't be curious about, but they're naturally curious. Um, and what historians do is frame a question to drive their research. And we know through brain research that the human brain is driven by novelty and questions. Anytime that you give the brain something that they don't know about, either it's dissonance, a difference between what they see and what they thought they knew, or something novel, the brain fires. And when a brain fires, our life just got easier, because a dull brain is really hard to teach. And we know that questions, good questions, intrigue students, and they draw them in. Um, we also know that questions are important for our discipline. Our discipline is defined by huge volumes of stuff. And we know that what questions do is to help students organize the stuff that we teach. Um, students make sense of seemingly isolated facts or skills by exploring stuff through questions. And cognitively, when you have a question that's guiding your way through the Civil War, the question helps you to remember the information. One of my favorite quotes comes from Jay McTighe and Grant Wiggins, um, who've done a tremendous amount of research on questions and instruction. And they said, if the content you teach represents answers, and ours always does, go one step further. What was the question that people were asking that led them to those answers? And then start with those questions, because it's the questions that are intriguing. And so the first thing, um, that I did was began in my second year to recast uh, my lessons. I framed all of my lessons around questions that gave students the opportunity to dive in. Who should be responsible for the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire? Jacob Reese, documenting or manipulating the, the past. Uh, did deindustrialization make America stronger or weaker? And immediately what I found is that if you got the right question, student engagement interest went up. Now keep in mind, they're teenagers. Student engagement and interest going up, all I needed is to go up for 45 to 60 minutes. <laughs> I don't need a lifetime. I need them engaged for that period of time that they were with me so that we can study the past. The second thing that comes out of the research is that historians are nosy. Someone at the end mentioned primary sources. Historians, they want to read your love letters. They want to sift through your garbage. They'll want to read your emails. At some point in time, they'd like to read your texts. Can you only imagine? Who else do we know that's nosy? Students, why are you wearing those shoes? Are you married? They're nosy. They want to know about everything. And we got to get them nosy about history. Um, and Bruce Van Sledwright, who I mentioned was a middle school teacher and has done a tremendous amount of research on this instruction at the upper elementary and the middle school level, talks about the fact that what uh, historians do is source work. After an historian poses a question, they dive into the stuff of history. And so if you go back to math for a second, math starts with a problem, and then you have to show what? You have to show your work, and it has to be written in what? Pencil. Good, you know your math teachers. Um, what Van Sledwright argues is that if students are going to be engaged in the past, just posing a question isn't enough. They then need to dive in to the stuff of history. Political cartoons, music, artwork, government documents, other historians' interpretations, to get their hands dirty with the stuff of history. Um, and the purpose of looking at those sources is not just to say, oh, I looked at a map today. 
It's to draw information out to build your argument that answers that question. Just like in math, you start to do things with the numbers that help you lead to your answer. In history, we do stuff with dead people's leftovers to come to answers about historic questions. Um, I'm going to skip that one. If you look at the packet that I think was slid into your book when you came in, much of this source work leads to the research of Sam Weinberg. Um, Sam Weinberg's most famous and most impactful study was to look at how students and historians read historic sources. And so he brought in 10 AP US history students, cream of the crop, and he brought in 10 university trained historians. And he asked them to do one simple thing. He said, I'm going to give you a document, and all I want you to do is think aloud. I want you to tell me what's going on upstairs while you're reading through this document. And so the AP US history students came in, and they picked up the document, and they read it. They gave them a summary, and they put it down. And the researchers were kind of waiting, but they were done. The historians then came in. They picked up the document, and they didn't read it. The first thing they did was start to ask questions about who wrote it? Who is this, this author? What's their connection to the time period? Why did they write this? Then they didn't read it. Then they asked questions about when the document was written. Was it written in the heat of battle? Was it written at the 100th anniversary? And how might that impact the information? Now remember, the AP students, they're done. <laughs> They have summarized the document, and they're finished. Then the historians actually began to read the document. But interestingly enough, they kept stopping. They'd read a couple sentences, and then they'd say, well, why would this person, who is best friends with so-and-so, say this? Or why would they say this 100 years later? And they began to connect the author and the time period to the argument that was being made. And then finally, before they set them down, the historians ask questions like, well, do you have anything else I could read? Do you have something written by a person with this perspective? And what Weinberg has shown is that our students, when they confront a text, see it as one-dimensional. Your students, my students, do not see any difference between a textbook, a worksheet, and the Emancipation Proclamation. For them, they're simply words on a page, and their goal is to read and summarize. And what Weinberg has shown is that students as early as third grade can start to critically look at information, where it came from, and use it to build arguments. Um, and what the research shows is that we can teach our students to look at evidence as three-dimensional, that not only is there information in it, the text, but there is an audience, what I call the subtext. Private letters are written for a certain audience. Public speeches are written for a different audience. We also know that there's an author behind there, that uh, documents are written by people for certain reasons with certain backgrounds, and that students can learn to understand that the author of a document can change what that document says. And then, that things are written in a time period. And so the easiest way to solidify this is that I give my students uh, a breakup letter that was written to me by my seventh grade girlfriend. And immediately they realize that who wrote it makes a difference in what you might think about Mr. Lesh. And when it was written might make a difference in what you think about Mr. Lesh. It was a very, very important relationship. It started Monday. Tuesday, she asked to wear my football jacket. Wednesday, it was over. <laughs> but you can build within students the ability to attack documents. If you go back to math for a second, we teach students what happens when negative and positive numbers come together. We teach students order of operations, what to do when the parentheses show up. That's the doing the work of math, and this becomes the doing the work of history. Um, and of course, in history, all of our work is to answer 
that driving central question about whatever we're learning. Anytime my students dealt with an historic source, we used our order of operations for history. First, we asked questions about the subtext. What do we know about the author? What do we know about their background? How might it impact what they've done? What do we know about the context? What do we know about the time period that was written? How might that impact it? Then we read the source, and then we have to corroborate with other sources. Um, and what we'll do in a few minutes is start to employ these skills in the context of a lesson to see how you would do this with students and the kind of things that you might have to build into your instruction. The last part of the research indicates that what historians love to do is argue. Who else do we work with that loves to argue? Kids. They will argue about anything <laughs> just to avoid having to do any work. They have to make their arguments in what two ways? One is in their writing, whether it's books or articles, they argue back and forth with, through their writing. And the second way, in the classroom, their lectures. And if you think about it, because you're wise enough now, when you were sitting in that classroom, your historian was making a selective argument about the past. He or she was giving you their interpretation about the causes of the Civil War or what have you.